All right, awesome. So again, thank you everybody for joining us today for our March Lunch and Learn webinar on coastal native plants for Brevard County. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Skip Healy, the owner and designer of Change of Greenery. Skip is the own OM. He was uh, born and raised in Brevard County and earned a bachelor's degree in agribusiness with a horticultural minor from Mississippi State University. He worked in greenhouses and garden centers across the state, including Epcot's The Land Pavilion. His education and industry experience brought him to start a landscaping design firm with the purpose of implementing Florida native and edible landscapes. Focusing on providing habitat to native pollinators and wildlife through sustainable approaches and lagoon friendly plantings, all in order to preserve Brevard's natural beauty. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our speaker, uh, Skip Healy. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, uh, this is gonna be kind of an overview of some native plants that are readily available in garden centers and native nurseries throughout the state, throughout the county. Um, and this is just kind of a, a taste of some of the natives that you can use in your landscape. So um, without further ado, we'll jump in. Um, See if I can get this going. All right. So uh, Nicole kind of read our mission statement, but I'll leave it up there for you. So um, my, as I, as Nicole said, I grew up in Brevard County in, in West Melbourne and grew up on a property that was lucky enough to have a lot of slash pines, cabbage palms, wax myrtles, um, kind of a, a pine forest um, ecology, if you will. Um, and I went to school in Mississippi, um, where a lot of the plant material doesn't necessarily uh, overlap with some of the stuff that we have down here. So uh, there was definitely another set of plant materials for me to learn. And uh, when I got back to Florida and started working in the nursery industry, I kind of got bit by the native bug and uh, really just wanted to shy away from using chemicals and um, with the bad algae blooms that we had in 2013, um, that kind of sparked really my drive into what I do now, um, which is install and design Florida native landscapes using Florida native plants. Um, and we do this so we don't have to use fertilizer and so we can provide habitat to all of the little critters of Brevard County. So, so with native plants, you wanna be species selective. Um, for a lot of the wildflowers, the trees, things like that, we may have multiple species of that genus, not only native to Brevard County, but throughout the state. So you may be buying a plant that, um, let's say for uh, instance, goldenrod, we have several different goldenrods that grow in Brevard County, but uh, there's gonna be a right plant for your location. Everything's kind of ecotype specific. So um, you wanna make sure that you're doing correct spot selection for those plants. Um, the other thing is, there's been a lot of trademark varieties of plants. So if you look in this picture, we have a picture of seed grown native Gallardia blanket flower. Uh, it's Gallardia pulchella, um, but you might find in some of the more common big garden centers and box stores that they sell a Gallardia that maybe has uh, a hyphenated name next to it, like Goblin or um, something like that. And usually these varieties have been bred to be either compact, um, sterile, with so their seed isn't viable, um, or just have a, some sort of feature that the breeder was going after. Now, by having native seed grown wildflowers, you're able to correctly encourage the spread of wildflowers throughout your garden and also provide something that the native pollinators are searching for. So just a little background on that. So habitat restoration um, on a micro level is really why we um, do what we do and use the plants that we use. We wanna bring in the butterflies and bring in the birds um, and other native pollinators that we have. Um, and we can do this through trees, we can do this through grasses, um, and we'll touch on some of those uh, plants that we use and uh, why we use them and what, what the benefits of doing that are. So we like to provide shelter. We like to provide food for these birds, for these bunnies, um, reducing impact on the watershed. So no matter if you're out closer to the St. John's or if you're closer to the Indian River Lagoon, everybody in Brevard County um, is connected to a watershed essentially from your yard. So the 
plant that you plant in your yard matters and the impact that your yard has on the Indian River Lagoon or the St. John's really does come into play. So um, I know the MRC is, this is like preaching to the choir with the MRC, but um, you know, there's great resources out there. Um, Nicole pulled up the Lagoon Loyal um, program, which is a great program to help give you uh, different initiatives and you can collect points uh, through using, through shopping with uh, Lagoon friendly companies. So, all right. So as I said in the beginning, we're just gonna touch on some of the native trees, uh, shrubs, grasses, ground covers, wildflowers that are readily available in uh, the garden centers and the native nurseries around Brevard County. Um, there's definitely some more selective kind of specimens that you can get and you can kind of hunt after, but this is the stuff that, you know, you could access easily and have good success with. So, um, all, by the way, all these pictures were taking, taken by me um, at landscapes that we've installed or maintained. So um, we'll start with the large trees. So the oak species. So we have several uh, oak species here in Brevard County. We have the live oak, Quercus virginiana, uh, the laurel oak, and we also have the sand live oak, Quercus germinata. Um, the sand live is going to have a smaller stature, more character to the um, it's not going to have a real upright trunk. There's going to be a little bit of bending here and there. You're going to find uh, sand live oaks uh, closer to the coast of Brevard County, inland towards, you know, um, I guess in Melbourne, you can see them in Wickham Park, um, some areas like that. The live oaks are going to have the longest lifespan, provide the, the largest amount of shade and um, a great amount of habitat for birds. Um, we have a couple different pine species um, that occur here in Brevard. We have the slash pine and we also have the sand pine. Uh, again, the sand pine is going to be a little bit closer to the river um, in areas like that. They're going to have smaller cones, um, smaller needles, and overall a smaller stature. So elms, we have the winged elm. We also have the American elm. Now, uh, I wouldn't say that these are highly salt tolerant trees, but uh, I have seen them grow within a you know, half mile of the ocean and, and be fine within a residential neighborhood. Um, but usually the elms you'll see in a wetter area as well as the mulberry. Um, so if you look in this, I guess I'm sharing my screen, I can use my cursor. If you look at this tree here, this is a red mulberry that was planted, Morris rubra. Um, so this time of year, uh, as they leaf out from their dormancy, they're going to send fruit out at the shoots too. So, um, and I don't know if ever, anybody's ever had a mulberry similar, uh, it's like an aggregate little berry similar to the a blackberry except elongated. Um, I like the flavor of them. It's kind of between a blueberry and a blackberry. Um, Southern red cedar. Um, this is gonna be a great screening tree if you just want something dense and tall um, that provides a great amount of habitat through shelter and through the berries that it produces. Um, I wouldn't, they have what's called awls. Um, so it's not necessarily like a leaf, but it's kind of that like juniper like texture to it. Um, they look similar to like a Christmas tree would. Um, and you can actually, uh, I encourage folks next year for Christmas to purchase maybe a seven gallon Southern red cedar and use that in a pot as your Christmas tree and then maybe plant it in your yard afterwards. Gumbo limbo is one of my favorite trees. Uh, it has that peeling bark. It's referred to as the tourist tree because of that. Um, these are gonna be highly cell tolerant trees. Um, again, kind of like the sand live oak, they have generally a character to their trunks. So they're not gonna be upright, um, perfect little lollipops. Uh, they're gonna have some, some quirkiness to them, but I think that's what gives them character. Sea grape, um, this is a plant that grows right on the dunes. Most folks are familiar with it from going to the beach. Um, it provides a great amount of habitat through not only its um, shelter that it provides because they're such large specimen, but the berries are edible to a lot of different birds and uh, small mammals, go for tortoises, even humans can eat those uh, berries. So they, they have a little bit of a uh, rich flavor, I guess you could say, compared to like a grape you'd buy at the store. Uh, and they have a large seed, but you can definitely make jams and jellies out of those fruit. Um, 
if the birds don't get them before you do. And they create a, an enormous amount of leaf litter, which in my opinion is a benefit um, because it brings up insects you know, to these leaves that in turn, some of these birds come down and, and find, especially during the fall um, when birds are migrating through. So um, it's, it's a great plant to have. And I always look at the, the leaf litter like free mulch, essentially. And the cabbage palm, that's the state tree. So the sable palmetto, um, you can see down on the right corner, we were putting some in uh, with the skid steer and you can usually purchase those, what they call slick trunk, like the one you see there or booted. Uh, these boots that these cabbage palms have are basically the base of the palm fronds that were pruned off of the palm. Um, and the boots do provide a good amount of habitat in themselves, not only for kind of perch spots for birds, but uh, they sometimes uh, leave berries that they have eaten inside, like strangler figs um, that can grow inside those cabbage palm boots. And there's an enormous amount of insects that find their homes in there as well. So the birds enjoy that. And the royal palm. So royal palm is going to be more of a South Florida native, but we can push the limits a little bit in Brevard County because we kind of straddle a few zones, um, if you will, planting zones that is. So um, you may not want to be planting royal palms in MIMS, but um, you know, down on the mainland, you can probably plant them from, I'd say, Rockledge South um, and on the beach side all the way up through the Cape. And these are going to be a, a very large palm. So uh, if you do plant a royal palm, just be aware they're a self-cleaning palm. Those palm fronds will fall off on their own, so and they can be fairly heavy. So just keep that in mind. You don't want it in a real high foot traffic area or right next to a driveway. All right, I'm going to move on to some of the smaller to medium trees. Um, and you'll see that some of these plants, they could also be categorized in the shrub um, page that I'm gonna go through, but there's not really a real term for some of these plants, um, whether they're a shrub or a tree, there's not really shrubs in native plant worlds. They're all just understory plants underneath large trees. So um, it's how humans perceive them and shape them into what they are categorized as. So. Uh, we'll start with the stoppers. This is a good group of uh, native trees. Um, you can see the Simpson stoppers growing in Erna Nixon Park, and um, there's some great specimens in Erna Nixon Park. I'd, I'd encourage you to check out. They have a smooth trunk, similar to like a crepe myrtle would, um, and they have a smaller foliage. All, all of them have a smaller foliage, uh, except for the red and the white, um, and they have a nice little flower that's getting ready to start blooming that turns into a red berry that uh, the birds in turn like. So uh, the Spanish stopper, kind of similar features. It would like to be in a little bit wetter area if possible. Um, the white stopper has a nice kind of columnar growth habit to it, a little bit larger leaf. Um, and it's actually a fragrant leaf. You might smell it if you walk through Maritime Hammock Sanctuary down on the South Beach side. Um, and it, it has really just kind of a nice understory tree look to it. Um, and the, again, the berries are beloved by the birds. And the red stopper um, does a little bit better in South Florida, but again, you can push the limits a little bit with those as well. And they have a, a beautiful red to the new growth as they come through. So does the, the Simpson and the white. So the wild lime, um, unfortunately, this doesn't produce necessarily like a lime we would use for cocktails. Um, it does produce a small fruit. It is in the citrus genus. Um, or the citrus family, excuse me, it's not uh, the citrus genus, but uh, it's gonna be one that's very thorny uh, like other citrus plants and is great if you uh, need to keep someone from coming in your yard. Uh, it's a host plant to swallowtail butterflies. The Myrcene, Myrcene cubana, you're gonna find this uh, in Erna Nixon Park and in Turkey Creek Sanctuary, Maritime Hammock Sanctuary. So uh, more of like the oak hammock understory. Uh, kind of a large rounder leaf to it um, and again it puts out a, a it's actually related to wax myrtle so if you've ever noticed how wax myrtle uh, flowers it's right on the stem with very small berries similar with the mirror scene. Marlberry um, this is another one you'd find it in the same spot uh, that I just mentioned like Erna Nixon Park they put out a cluster of berries after a white flower that is fragrant um, kind of a glossier leaf, stiffer leaf to it, um, but a longer one, maybe about two to three inches long and about an inch wide. So very attractive plant. 
The buttonwoods a lot of uh, folks are familiar with. Uh, the green buttonwood often grows naturally in occurrence with mangroves, so it can take a real wet um, kind of brackish foot. Um, the silver buttonwood you see a lot in the landscape industry used as a shrub, uh, used as a small tree to um, put in medians and, and uh, parking lots and things like that. Uh, both are great trees to use in the landscape. Um, they do provide a small kind of inconspicuous flower that does have a nice fragrance to it and then puts out these uh, kind of seeds that, that almost look like buttons, um, so hence the name. Um, but they do have a kind of a corky bark to them, um, which is good for air plants. So if uh, you have a bunch of air plants you need to put on a tree but don't have the tree, that might be a good specimen for you. Fiddlewood is one of my favorites. This is another one that would categorize also as a shrub, depending on how it was maintained, but uh, they can get 20 plus feet. So it, it can be a, a nice specimen tree, kind of a, a longer um, waxier leaf. This is actually a fiddlewood specimen uh, right here. So, uh, and they get a white flower set that comes out um, maybe about like a two inch uh, little stretch of flowers that is, almost the same scent as jasmine or gardenia would be, that kind of nice perfumey uh, white flower fragrance. And they're very salt tolerant. Um, sweet acacia, I think is an underused tree myself. You see a lot of desert cassias and other non-native cassias um, planted in landscapes uh, where the sweet acacia, it, it has that kind of pinnate leaf to it like cassia would, um, and we do have native cassias, by the way, but um, the sweet acacia it does have thorns, um, but it has these little yellow pom-pom like flowers on them uh, that are fragrant. In India, they actually grow it for the perfume industry. Um, and then it puts out a legume-like seed pod that the birds go after. Um, the Florida thatch palm, this is one that's uh, South Florida native, but again, we can push the limits. I'd say beachside all the way up through Cape Canaveral, I've seen them grow. Um, and in, in the mainland, you could probably push it up through Melbourne. Um, it's a great little palm. You can see it down on the bottom on the right. It has this thatchy burlap kind of um, thatch in between the fronds as it grows up. It's a smaller statured palm, um, very kind of skinny, um, but with large fronds on it. Buccaneer palm. Um, so this is Pseudophoenix sargentii. You can see it right here on the bottom left. A beautiful self-cleaning South Florida palm, um, native uh, mostly down towards the Miami area. Unfortunately, they were wildly harvested for a long time, but now there are growers that are actively propagating these through seed. Um, so these are another one that it might not take the cold as well on the mainland north of Melbourne, let's say, um, but you can probably push it up to about Cocoa Beach, Cape Canaveral with the um, on the beach side. All right, so we're gonna start with our shrubs section. So again, uh, naturally some of these plants might grow more shrub-like depending on how many seeds were dispersed in that one area and germinated um, or it, in the wild that is, or um, it would be how a human maintained them. So um, firebush is a beautiful shrub that is commonly used and commonly available in garden centers. You can see it on the top right with the zebra long-winged butterfly has those uh, tubular shaped blooms that kind of go from a red to an orange, uh, larger leaves, and uh, it provides nectar to butterflies, it provides nectar to hummingbirds, and you'll also see different songbirds and um, go after this, the berries that they put out. Now this is one to be species selective with, as I mentioned in one of our first slides, because there are dwarf firebush, dwarf firebush sold, and uh, those dwarf firebush can are actually native to South Africa. Um, they just have a smaller leaf set and a smaller bloom on them. Uh, that's the only thing that would make them a, a quote unquote dwarf. Um, they can actually get 12 to 14 feet, um, just like the native firebush would. And they're so similar genetically that if they were in a similar area as a native firebush, or if just uh, a pollinator went from one to another, those genes in the berry that it would produce might be mixed. Um, so there's potential for us to kind of lose our native firebush over time, the more these dwarf firebush are implemented into landscapes. Um, so 
ask for your native fire bush if you're ever considering. And I think it's more beautiful in my opinion. It has larger leaves to it. It gets more of a fall color with that kind of red undertone. Um, so that's enough about fire bush, sorry. Uh, there's a few different coffees uh, that we have native to Florida, and these aren't uh, necessarily like Arabica coffee like we would brew. Um, in fact, if you read the genus and species on the wild coffee, Psychotria nervosa, that might not be something that you'd like to brew for your breakfast. Um, but they are a great shrub. They have a shiny leaf to them, the wild coffee that is, and a white cluster of blooms. Um, they produce a berry that is about uh, the size of a blueberry and uh, becomes kind of a red berry attracting the birds. Uh, the soft leaf coffee, similar um, stature, similar growing conditions, although it, I find that it can take a little more sun um, and it has a softer leaf to it. So that's it's not going to be as shiny as the wild coffee. But these are both great pollinator attractors and uh, bird food um, providers. Florida privet is one of my favorite um, quote unquote shrubs or small trees. Uh, it is just finishing up its bloom cycle for the most part right now. Uh, they're one of the first shrubs uh, to bloom in the new year. So you're gonna notice very inconspicuous, uh, almost highlighter green, yellow flowers on these guys, uh, a smaller leaf set. So that does make it a little bit better if you're gonna maintain a, a hedge. So um, in general, you don't wanna use plants that have large leaves as a hedge that you're gonna be maintaining at a certain height over time, uh, because the more you cut on those with shears, the worse they're gonna look. Um, so if you have a plant with smaller leaves, when they grow back, it's not gonna look like you just chopped all the leaves in half up on top of the plant. But um, they, the Florida Privet provides awesome pollinator nectar, and then it also provides um, great cover for birds and uh, great berries for birds as well. Walter's Viburnum, you see on the bottom right corner over here, um, this was just taken a week or so ago at my house. So that's another one with a smaller leaf set on it. So I have seen it uh, used in some commercial landscapes like some of the Wawa's and Cumberland Farms that have been popping up. The, uh, the Wawa on John Rhodes Boulevard and uh, O'Galley Boulevard um, has this as their perimeter shrub. So. Uh, this is one that follows the privet. Just after the privet, they'll start blooming and then they'll produce their berries. So another great one for birds and pollinators. Privet Cinna um, is kind of an interesting one. So Cinna lugastrina, you can see right here and kind of this uh, under this awning. So it's a host plant to a couple different butterflies, mostly the sulfur butterflies, orange barred sulfur and yellow sulfur. Um, it puts out a seed pod after it blooms that uh, birds love. They look like a legume, similar to like the sweet acacia or some of the cassias. Um, so this is a, a nice one just as a specimen. It's not one that I would do necessarily a mass planting of because they all want to do something different. Necklace pod. Necklace pod is similar to the um, Cinna in that it's, it's more of a good specimen plant. Um, and this is another one to be aware of that we do have a non-native necklace pod that is sold in garden centers throughout Brevard County. Um, so when you're asking for Sephora tomentosa necklace pod, make sure you ask if it's variety truncata. So they're gonna have um, a little bit of a soft growth to them on the new growth, but they're gonna be much duller than the Sephora tomentosa commonly sold in garden centers. Um, but a great plant. Uh, it has a nice stature to it, nice leaf shape, kind of a, a dullish gray uh, hue to it, and then puts out almost like a candelabra yellow flower. So, Kunti, a lot of folks are familiar with. These are planted in municipalities a lot because they um, seem to be fairly bulletproof. Um, they can do sun, they can do shade, um, they can do a little bit wet, they can do drier. So um, typically, uh, we use Kuntis more as a background or an accent plant, um, and they're a host plant to the Atala butterfly, which um, was almost extinct a few decades ago, and recently we've been able to see them on our projects and also throughout Brevard County, um, where Kuntis have been used in public landscapes. So um, it's a beautiful little black and uh, blue hair streak butterfly. And salt palmetto. So this is another reason why we can't necessarily categorize shrubs with, with native plants. So salt palmettos I would put in that category mainly because the height that they can get, the fact that you can use them for screening, um, and the salt palmetto is probably the most habitat that you could provide to any 
uh, little critter in Brevard County. So makes great shelter uh, for gopher tortoises. Um, all sorts of small mammals live in gopher tortoise holes. Um, the berries are eaten by a number of animals and uh, the pollen is beloved by the bees. You also see the, the salt palmetto, the palmetto honey uh, sold. All right, so grasses are some of my favorites to use in some of our landscapes and there's, you gotta be somewhat specific with your selection on the grasses on uh, what you're gonna use where. Um, so for instance, sand cord grass um, is a great grass in a, a area where you're not gonna be cutting it back a lot um, because when they do get cut back seasonally, they get a real thatchy base to them um, and the blades, I guess you could call them on the grass or a rounder. So they're not gonna be something that, um, it just looks a little funny when it gets cut back. So something that I would put also where it's gonna have sometimes a wet foot, it can take a wet foot a lot, um, but it can do drier conditions as well. But um, if I had you know, a pond bank on a retention pond, that's one I would use. Salt meadow cord grass is also in the cord grass, the Spartina genus, um, but this is one that's gonna, uh, leave its footprint a little bit. So it's gonna spread throughout from where you've planted it, which is great. Um, but again, one that's gonna want a wetter foot can even do, um, you know, weeks and months underwater. So Fakahatchee grass, um, this is the bottom right you see over here. They kind of have a wider blade, maybe about a half inch to um, three quarter inch uh, grass blade. They do have a little bit of a um, cutting factor. So be careful, wear gloves, long sleeves if you are playing with Fakahatchee grass. Um, and you'll see that they kind of put out their inflorescence on a stalk over here. Um, this one doesn't seem to have any up, but um, more of, it's not necessarily like a showy flower, but it is important um, to that plant's health. Um, so that's Tripsacum dactyloides, and you'll see dwarf Fakahatchee down here below. Dwarf Fakahatchee is also known as Eastern Gamma Grass, um, Tripsacum floridanum. Um, and both these grasses uh, are great for uh, some permaculture uses too, as chop and drop. So you can use these grasses um, to kind of build up your soil. Um, and they can take cutbacks a lot better than a cord grass would. Um, they just look nicer generally. Uh, we tend not to cut our grasses in, on our maintenance accounts other than once a year. Um, and not all of the grasses always get it at the same time. So um, muley grass is a great example. This is a grass that is used in a lot of municipalities and medians, um, landscapes, commercial uh, landscapes, residentials. It's got that beautiful pink plume uh, flower in the fall through the winter. So this is one that we would cut back after it's done flowering. Um, it's a shame when you see some municipalities um, cut these grasses back at the wrong time of the year right before they're about to put on their peak performance. So um, just let your muley grass flower all the way through, make sure it's done, and then you can uh, kind of grab it like a ponytail and, and cut maybe about a, a foot up from there. And whenever you cut back your grasses, use your grass blades that you've cut off your plants to kind of mulch underneath. Um, it's great to just add to the soil, build it up a little bit, um, and no sense in wasting all that good stuff. Lopsided Indian grass is a very uh, interesting showy grass. You can find it in Malabar Scrub Sanctuary. Um, and it's, it's very hard to describe the flower on that one. So I'd, I'd ask that you look that up. Elliot's Love Grass. Um, this is a great little border grass that we like to use. You can see it kind of here with the silvery foliage and almost a, a plume-like flower to it, kind of dainty bloom like the muley grass does. Not necessarily as much pop of color, but uh, it is a great little grass to use. Gets roughly about a foot tall, maybe about 18 inches wide. And there is also a purple love grass as well that's in the same genus as the Elliot's that we use also. Uh, Blue-eyed grass, you can see just kind of peeking out underneath here on the dwarf Fakahatchee grass. These are in bloom right now. Um, if you drive up th US-1 through uh, north of Yera Boulevard, through Rockledge, you'll see these blooming in the medians. Um, it's actually in the iris family, and if you look at uh, these blades, um, they kind of come out in a world pattern and stay flatter um, than some of the other small grasses like that would. All right, here's the fun stuff everybody's always wondering about. So. Uh, we use Sunshine Mimosa as a ground cover for high foot traffic areas, um, areas where 
we don't want to use turf grass, so we need something thick um, that can take a lot of full sun. Uh, you can see this little pink powder puff flower right here. And behind me on the screen, um, you can kind of see it used in a landscape back there as well. So um, this is a nice lush ground cover. It taps in at its inner nodes as it grows, meaning every time it sends out a leaf on its uh, rhizome, that modified stem along the ground, it's gonna tap in with its roots. And those roots are actually nitrogen fixing. They put out little uh, nodes, what they call nodes on the roots themselves. So if you had this potentially planted near um, a fruit tree, um, it would provide some of the nitrogen that maybe your fruit tree is requiring a little more of than like a native tree would. But other than that, it's a great ground cover to use to eat up area, um, to just kind of have a nice um, pseudo lawn, if you will, and also bring in the pollinators in doing so. They bloom throughout the early part of the day. So uh, you usually see the most action as far as pollinators go towards the morning. So that's Mimosa strigolosa. So uh, next one is frog fruit. Um, you can kind of see it tucked in. It's not the larger leaf uh, ground cover here. It's the smaller stuff. And this one is also good as a lawn alternative, but not for a high foot traffic lawn. So if you have dogs that are crazy and love to run, do laps and things like that, it's not necessarily the best for that. But if you have an area of lawn that you really don't use that much and you are sick of watering uh, constantly and um, putting chemicals on, and I hope you're not doing that, but um, this is a great alternative. So the frog fruit is Phyllonotiflora. It's also known as turkey tangle, um, and it has a little matchstick flower on it. That's great for pollinators, but it's also a host plant to white peacock butterflies. So you'll often see this one mixed in with uh, kind of mow as you grow lawns, um, lawns that are more of a mixed bag, if you will. Sometimes you'll see this frog fruit make its way in. Um, and if you do have that uh, situation, definitely encourage it. Sea purslane. Um, so this is one I don't have a good picture of on here, but uh, this is one that you and I could eat the leaves on it, uh, very salty, um, but they will grow on the bank um, from the dunes uh, in through uh, the Indian River on uh, coquina walls and things like that. So this is one that uh, it doesn't take a lot of foot traffic. It's more of almost like a succulent in its growth habit so it's uh, it's a little fragile um, but it is great uh, dune stabilizer it can take a flood um, and also we've seen manatees uh, come up and eat it on some of our accounts railroad vine is another one that i've seen some manatees eat before too you can see these large leaves here uh, you'll see this growing naturally uh, on the dunes on the beach and uh, in through the lagoon um, it can eat up a lot of area and be a little bit aggressive but um, in certain maintenance accounts, we've been able to keep it in check, um, depending on how large that area is. Uh, it gets these large leaves on it. It gets a beautiful, uh, it's in the same genus as sweet potatoes in Morning Glory. So a similar flower to a Morning Glory, just more of a pink than a purple, um, if you will. And this one again can uh, be a great seawall stabilizer, dune stabilizer. It taps in at its, at its uh, inner nodes like uh, Sunshine Mimosa would. Twin flower is a great um, alternative ground cover to use in a shady area. So if you have a large oak tree, um, I would suggest looking into twin flower. Um, and these are host plants to the buckeye butterflies, the common buckeye butterflies, and a few more, I'm pretty sure. Uh, coastal ambrosia. This is one that um, it has a very interesting foliage. And I think I have a picture of it on the next slide we'll look at. Um, it's going to be a low growing ground cover. Um, it doesn't root in at the inner nodes necessarily, and it's more of a large leaf and kind of a thicker stemmed ground cover, so it can become aggressive as well. Um, but if you have an area that you can encourage it to be aggressive, it's a, it's a great choice. River sage. So you can see this little blue sage um, ground cover here in the picture. So uh, river sage is, is pretty versatile. Um, we've seen it do well in shade, um, pretty deep shade under a live oak tree and also seen it do great in full sun, like in this picture. So uh, it's gonna be a low growing creeping ground cover and similar to the frog fruit, it actually shows up sometimes in, in mixed lawns already. So you may notice these little blue flowers start popping up when you haven't mowed your lawn for a month. But like the other salvias, it does have a fragrant foliage um, and it's, it's nice for, for pollinators to come and visit. All right, so 
there is a whole world of native wildflowers out there. And again, uh, remember to be species selective with your native wildflowers, figure out exactly what's good for your particular town, your particular neighborhood, um, and especially, you know, the east coast of Florida, because there are plants that are going to be in uh, the same genus and even same species uh, that are going to be more on the west coast. They're going to have a, a different variety, similar to like how we saw with the necklace pod. So. Um, Salvia coccinea, so uh, red sage, scarlet sage, tropical sage is usually how it's described. You can see it right here um, with these beautiful little blooms. Uh, they're, they have that tubular shape, so more of a butterfly nectar plant than uh, a lot of other pollinators would. Um, it would prefer a little dappled light. It doesn't do great in full sun, although we have planted in full sun with some success. So. Um, Giant ironweed, you can see down on the right over here. This is going to be uh, a larger leafed wildflower that comes up on a stalk that um, emerges once spring comes through. It's going to start pushing its leaves back out, almost goes completely dormant in the winter. And then uh, as at the base of the leaves, it'll start to send up what's going to be its flower stalk that can reach roughly about five to six feet if it's allowed to. Usually if it gets that tall, it will lean over. But these beautiful little, uh, almost like paintbrush-like purple flowers Dune sunflower, you can see up in the top right, and this is mixed in with coastal ambrosia here. So uh, you can see the coastal ambrosia leaves, they, they almost have that, they look like a scented geranium almost to me, but um, the dune sunflower is going to be a space eater. So I say that in meaning, you know, if you plant a dune sunflower, prepare to have five to six feet on either side of where you planted that plant to let it swallow everything up. Um, but which is, that's great for, you know, little critters to hide under. Um, and then it's also beloved by all the pollinators. And it's very high, highly salt tolerant. So you'll see this growing on the cracks of A1A, you know, and, and just getting obliterated by sun and salt. Porterweed, so this is one to be species selective with. So there are non-native porterweeds that are sold in garden centers. Um, and those are gonna be porterweeds uh, that are same genus, Statutarfeta, uh, but they're going to be much more of an upright and taller growth habit, some reaching five to six feet. Whereas our native Jamaicensis, Statutarfeta Jamaicensis, it's going to be a lower growing kind of creeping wildflower, almost like a ground cover. It could be categorized as that in some regard. Um, beautiful purple blooms on it. Uh, it's an attractive nectar plant for a lot of butterflies. All right, just a few slides left. So uh, blanket flower is another one that uh, is commonly used and you'll see sold in garden centers, but another one to be uh, aware of what species you're buying. Uh, you want to buy seed grown native uh, Gallardia pulchella, um, nothing that has a, a fun nickname on it. Um, you'll see those down here. This is a seed, a good example of seed grown Gallardia because you'll notice that in the same plant, you'll have different blooms that are, you know, all red, some with a red center and a yellow um, petals on the end, and then kind of flipped on some of the flowers too. So it just creates for more genetic diversity if you have seed grown native wildflowers. Um, this one again can be a little bit of a space eater like the blanket flower, but not quite as significant. Um, it's really good gopher tortoise food. Um, so if you have any resident gopher tortoises, this is a good one to plant for them. Uh, can take high uh, salt, can be dry, full sun. Um, so this is another one you might see growing in the cracks of A1A. Blazing Star, um, I really wish I didn't cut off this picture here, but Blazing Star, uh, Liatris spicata, is an example of wildflowers that we, we have this genus of wildflower throughout the state. So I believe there's over a dozen uh, native uh, Blazing Star species. So Liatris spicata is the one we use the most. Uh, it's proven to be pretty versatile. Um, it is noted for being able to take a wet foot, but it can also take a dry condition. You know, if we put it in a mulch bed, it, it does well. But um, it's going to be more of a grass um, type foliage down at the bottom throughout the spring. And in late spring, early summer, it starts to send up its uh, flower spikes. And you're going to see you know, dozens of, of blooms on this one stalk, and that stalk could get four to five feet tall if in a good condition. 
Orchard HP. Um, this is going to be one that's a little more shade tolerant. It can do full sun too, but um, it's also a nitrogen fixer. It's in that Fabaceae, the uh, pea family. Um, so it's going to have that legume-like seed pod on it that the birds absolutely love. A little uh, yellow bloom on it that is great for pollinators. And that pinnate leaf, so it's going to almost be like a small fern-like leaf to it. Um, they get a little bit woody, can reach up roughly about like three feet tall, um, but just great for a pop of texture, pop of color, and to bring in the pollinators. Black-eyed Susan's another one uh, that we have Rudbeckia species not only throughout Florida, but throughout the United States. Um, Rudbeckia herta is probably the most common, uh, well-performing one that you'd find in Brevard County. Um, and that's gonna be just like the name, Black-eyed Susan. So it's gonna be a yellow petaled flower with a black cone on the top of it, similar to like an echinacea cone flower um, shape, but black and yellow. Um, going to be roughly about a foot to 18 inches tall, maybe about a foot wide. Goldenrod. So goldenrods are uh, another one that we have several different species of throughout Brevard. Um, if you look here, this is a uh, solid semperviron's seaside goldenrod, um, and they're just finishing up blooming. So they start to really bloom in the fall through the winter, and uh, they're just pollinator magnets. You'll see so many different uh, pollinators flock to this plant. Um, and they do have a little bit of character. If they, if the stalks get, you know, five to six feet, sometimes they lay down and uh, turn back up. And so the, it's not one that, you know, if you really are going for a very structured look, um, probably not the best one for you. It's going to be a little bit too much maintenance to, to keep up with, but I've seen people be able to kind of cut them at the right time and um, get them to be a little bit more upright. But generally we like to let it, uh, perform its uh, duties just by being kind of wild and uh, having a little more character. Dotted horsemint, you can kind of see behind this uh, Gallardia pulchella. So uh, Monarda punctata. Uh, Monarda is a genus that is throughout the United States. So punctata is gonna be the species that's uh, the right plant for this area. And they're gonna have a beautiful bloom in the summer, uh, late summer, early fall pink with kind of a white speckly uh, look on the inside. And this one, just like the goldenrod, is a pollinator magnet. Um, you can actually use this as a pot herb too. So you can um, dehydrate the leaves and use them for teas. Um, they kind of have a, a sagey kind of fragrance to them. Um, they call it dotted horse mint. It's not as minty to me as it is more of like a, like a sage bush, but um, yeah. All right, so, so this is, a, just where you know we figure out how you guys can help. So buying plants from reputable sources. So uh, you know if you're in a garden center or like a box store, um, be very species selective with what you're purchasing. And I would encourage you more to shop with some of the native nurseries in Brevard County. Um, if you log on to plantrealflorida.com, uh, that will show the native nurseries within your area. That's the Florida Association of Native Nurseries website. So in, on that website, you can also find uh, native plant professionals like myself who um, may not just sell plants, but do landscape designs and uh, installations and uh, all sorts of professionals you can find throughout that directory. Talk to your neighbors, get them excited about native plants. You know, if they ask, you know, what you're doing or um, what your plan is, then, you know, let them know what plants you're planting and what that's going to help and how, um, you know, might help them as well just by being next to you and um, get them jazzed up about native plants. And of course, plant native plants. So um, at this time, you know, I'll take some questions if anybody has any, and I, I really appreciate everybody joining me today. Feel free to contact me at the information below. You can also go to changeofgreenery.org and uh, reach out to us there. And we hope to hear from you. Thank you very much for joining us. Awesome. Well, that was absolutely fantastic, Skip. You know, um, I learned so much and I loved all the kind of like insider tidbits you had with it too. Like I loved the descriptions of the different plants, like characteristics, how like, you know, you, you describe them kind of like, oh, we just let them spread around, you know, and you know, sometimes they fall over and sometimes they grow up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Um, awesome. Thank so you. We do have a few questions. For those of you that are participants, please submit your questions through the Q&A option. This is going to be the best way uh, to get your questions answered, um, as we are not um, having any participants, uh, at, we're not giving access to any participants' mics just because we are short on time. Um, so one of the questions that was submitted um, before the presentation was for a, um, do you have any suggestions for a fast growing, non-invasive, non-messy plant for a privacy border between neighbors? Sure, I mean, that would definitely depend on the light level and uh, kind of like what town you would be in, um, what your soil's like, but um, there's definitely a lot of options um, that we could play with. Um, I would definitely encourage you to reach out and maybe we can brainstorm and come up with some concepts. Uh, we do on-site consultations and uh, yeah, we, we can help you with that. Perfect, awesome. And that can actually lead into our next question. Um, someone asked, um, is your organization a chain of change of greenery also a nursery or just for landscaping? Uh, great question. We have been growing uh, plants. We had a, a lease on our property um, up until recently where we were growing to sell some plants to uh, Rockwood Gardens and at farmers markets and use at some of our um, on our jobs. Uh, right now we're kind of in a transition period where we're uh, looking for the right next property. Um, so we do still have plants, um, but we're not open to the public right now, but we soon hope to be. Um, and I should have more on that. And I can always forward that information to Nicole um, or feel free to, to reach out to me directly. Awesome. And um, so do you uh, maintain landscapes for clients as well? We do, yeah. Um, we're a little bit selective just because we are a small company. Um, you know, so we try to maintain especially the, the landscapes that we've installed. We, we love kind of keeping up with those and seeing how our projects evolve. Um, but we do maintenance as well on, on uh, other customers' homes that we didn't necessarily install. It just has to be the right fit. And are you willing to go to different counties or do you primarily work in Brevard County? Um, primarily in Brevard County, but we would be willing to travel if uh, the job was right. Okay, so there's some really fantastic questions. Um, all right, so trying to find the one that I, uh, okay. here we go. If I want to replace a backyard with sunshine mimosa, do I need to remove the turf first or can I just plant among it? You sure do. Um, so it's best to start with a clean slate. That way you can monitor the individual sunshine mimosa plants growth a little easier. Um, and the turf grass, you know, St. Augustine is, is fairly aggressive, just like St. or just like Sunshine Mimosa can be, and they compete at the surface. So both of them have those rhizomes that creep along the surface and tap in um, with their with their roots. So yeah, it's it's better to kind of start with a clean slate. Um, but there's definitely different methods to go about it, and we've done uh, mimosa plantings that some different uh, ways before. And speaking of mimosas, uh, there was one here that said, um, what are the water needs of sunshine mimosa? I always recommend with native plants to water upon installation by hand um, for the first few weeks, depending on the time of the year. Um, once we get into a rainy season, you shouldn't need to water it much more. With that said, sunshine mimosa does have a slight dormant period. Um, to where it's not necessarily growing as quickly as it would in the spring and the summer. So if you are going to do a project where you're planting sunshine mimosa, my suggestion is always wait till March, at least at the earliest, um, late February. Um, and then from there, it should be able to kind of pick up with the rainy season and, and start to fill in throughout the seasons. But um, I would definitely start with a clean slate and it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of mulch underneath too, to um, shade out or block out some weeds and provide some extra moisture. And speaking of mulch, what mulch should you use within a bed of new pollinator plants? Um, well, I would say stay away from dyed mulches, especially, you know, being that we're talking about uh, lagoon friendly landscaping. Um, so those dyes are no different than, you know, red dye number five or, or whatever it is. So that's gonna leach out um, and end up in the gutter and end up in the storm drains. So I would stay with stuff that's naturally colored. And I would also shy away from cypress mulch. Um, cypress mulch is 
chipped up from cypress trees that are you know hundreds of years old um, and so whereas the pine products the pine trees don't live as long um, and the barks and uh, pine straw aka pine needles um, those are natural byproducts of the pine industry so um, the pine barks you can get in really chunky sizes down to like an inch two inches all the way down to like the size of a dime so if you want really fine stuff but the nice thing about that is they're naturally colored um, they're not going to necessarily like lose their color and you feel like you have to remulch. They'll just break down over the course of a few years and then you would just add to replenish. And with the um, pine needles, um, do they make good mulch for sandy soils? Yeah, they can. Um, and when you purchase pine straw, um, it's going to be generally slash or longleaf pine needles, um, usually from the North Florida to Georgia uh, region. So, you know, keep in mind, like we have invasive pines in Brevard County, the Australian pine, and we also have uh, Norfolk Island pine. And both of those emit a toxin from their needles after they drop that kind of inhibit a lot of growth underneath. Whereas if you walk out to like a pine flatwood forest, there, there's other plants that are growing within that region. So um, they, they're fine for sandy soils. Um, just keep in mind, if you use pine straw, it's not gonna last as long as maybe a chunky pine bark nugget would. Um, it just decomposes a little bit quicker. So that's one that you would have to kind of stay on top of seasonally. And, and I'm assuming the wind, if you're on like a more beachy area, that would probably capture the pine needles a little bit easier as well. Sure, yeah. Well, the thing about it is it actually mats down pretty well. So once it's like been wet a few times, it, it holds its ground pretty well. Whereas uh, like large pine bark nuggets and mini nuggets, uh, they can blow around too. Um, and, and sometimes they're a little bit uh, quicker to do so and end up in, in the storm drain. Definitely good information to know. So um, use a border. Use a border, okay, to keep them in. Um, so you had a, a lot of really great information and I know it probably would have been like impossible to get pictures of everything that you mentioned. Um, do you have a good guide to look up the plants you suggested, like a, like a guide online or if you know of any yeah. guides? So I would type in, uh, whenever you're typing in one of these plants, uh, for starters, I would type in the plant, whether that's the common name or the Latin name, and then type in FNPS, that's going to take you to the Florida Native Plant Society um, website and they have a great directory for some of these plants. They generally only have, you know, a few photos for each, but um, my best suggestion would be to, um, if you see a native landscape, you know, kind of stop and admire and see if you can identify some of these specimen or go to a native nursery where they've uh, planted some of these specimens over the years and you can kind of get a feel for what a mature plant looks like. Very cool, yeah. And I've actually checked out the Florida Native Plant Society website before. And for those of you who have not, um, they actually have suggestions based on your location, I believe also within Brevard County and kind of whether you want more something that's more sunny or more uh, shady. Um, so definitely a great resource. And you also suggested the plantrealflorida.com as well? Yes, yeah, that's that's Florida Association of Native Nurseries, um, which I'm on the board for that. And uh, it's a great organization that supports uh, native plant professionals throughout the state. They've kind of spearheaded the, the growing aspect of and uh, restoration of Florida native plants and landscape uses. So definitely a great organization to support. Um, and uh, Florida Native Plant Society is as well. There's local chapters here in Brevard County um, that you can join. You can go to meetings and do uh, yard tours and all sorts of fun stuff like that. And your membership goes towards a good cause in uh, protecting wild Florida lands. I'm checking some of these things and for those of you that are submitting kind of um, uh, like questions about like where you can uh, purchase the Florida native uh, plants in Brevard County, um, I'll, I'll, in the follow up email that I will send, I'll send the links to the Florida Native Plant Society and I will also put the link in for uh, Plant Real Florida uh, as well so that you'll have direct access to those and then we'll also have Skip's contact information in there. Um, let's see. What about using oak leaves as mulch? I love it. It's free mulch. Um, you know, they break down pretty quick. Uh, and I think that they have a, a nice look to them personally. And, you know, if you have an oak tree that just keeps on dumping leaves on you, you might as well use it to your benefit. They also create great compost too. So if you have a compost bin going, uh, save your oak leaves. Um, they bring up a lot of insects that decompose 
plant material. Perfect. All right. So we have one, uh, another one that's um, a little bit different. Um, so we had one question submitted from Facebook that says, dying to know if you can rescue uh, air plants found on the ground or if that is a conservation no-no. Great question. Um, so I guess it depends who you talk to and what situation those plants might be in. Um, how well maintained the area is that you find them on the ground. Um, generally, if you can find a, another resting spot to, because usually they break off with whatever little branch they're on, if you can find a spot to kind of nook that in, it might have a chance to, to flower and put out more plants. So generally a no-no, um, but I would say if you know you have a friend or family member that has air plants naturally growing in some of their oak trees or some of their trees and they fall out, then that's that's okay. I think that you know collecting seed kind of is the same thing. You know we don't want to collect seed off of wild lands, and um, but if you plant these Florida native plants in your landscape and they're going to town with seed, then feel free to collect and share and plant more. Awesome. All, all definitely great information, and I appreciate you. You know saying like oh like maybe not take it, but like you know you have to you know. But yeah, like, I look at these alternatives. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you trim giant ironweed to stop it from falling over? And if so, at what height can you trim it? You sure can. Um, I would say it just kind of depends on how um, heavy it's starting to get at what size. Um, because if it starts to lean, you'll kind of be able to see the spot of where it's leaning. Look for, look to make the cut right above a leaf um, set. So you're not cutting, you know, right in the middle of a stem. Um, better to cut kind of near an internode. Um, and then really, I mean, you could cut it at about a couple feet up. Um, it just depends because whenever you cut it, it's going to branch out right at the cut. So it's going to not just have that one kind of shoot up at the top. It's going to create several shoots, which in turn will be heavier than that one shoot. So um, you can stake it up too if you'd like to, um, but you can definitely cut it back similar to the seaside goldenrod. If you cut it back on that uh, flower stalk, it's going to shoot out a, a couple of branches and then uh, you'll have you know maybe a tighter growth habit but it, it might be heavier in the end things you, you you don't know until you experience them yeah maintenance will, will help you learn a lot about and, and that's that's the great thing about native plants i mean i do not know at all as much as i want to know about native plants and there's so much more to learn and um you know as you watch these landscapes evolve um, then you can kind of get a sense of the plant's identity, essentially. So, let's see. So we are at our one o'clock time frame. Um, I don't know if you're able to answer a few more questions, Skip, or if you have anything that you need to go to. Um, um, I can hang out for a few more minutes, um, maybe about like five minutes or so. All right. So one or two more questions then. Okay. Uh, okay. Is there any ground cover plants that can survive under an oak tree? Yes, I would suggest either either one of the twin flowers, depending on where you live. Um, I have seen the river sage do well in uh, low light, and I've also seen um, oh, excuse me, it just just escaped my brain. Oh, frog fruit, frog fruit can do okay in dappled light as well, um, but it, it does better in full sun. But I would say twin flower would be my first choice. All right, awesome. And then, so our la our very last question is: I've heard that there are certain types of latana that are good or bad. Which one should I look for to plant at my house? Sure. So stay away from lantana camara. Uh, that's going to be the most common one that you find in garden centers with the uh, yellow and red and and kind of pink blooms on them. They have that kind of itchy, scratchy little leaf to it that's fragrant. Um, search out in this area, you'll search out what they call button sage lantana. It's going to be lantana involucrata, I-N-V-O-L-U-C-R-A-T-A. Um, and that's going to be more of a low shrub. Um, so anywhere from about two feet to four feet tall, depending on the spot, um, give or take two to three feet wide. Um, beautiful white bloom on it, similar to the lantana that you're probably more familiar with. 
and the berry turns that kind of purple color too. So much smaller leaf set on it and a smaller flower, but definitely more beneficial for our local environment. Awesome. Well, thank, thank you so much, Skip. Yeah, thank you guys. I, I really enjoyed it and I, I hope everybody got something from it. Um, and I hope that maybe we can do another one of these soon. Absolutely. Well, that was fantastic information. And for those of you that didn't get your questions answered, please feel free to email Skip at Change of Greenery Florida, so fl at gmail.com. And again, I'm going to be following up with an email that will have a recording of this presentation, um, links to the Florida Native Plant Society and plantrealflorida.com. And then we will also add the, um, we have a handbook that we are able to share um, for those of you that had a couple of questions about planting rain gardens. Um, so thank you so much again, Skip. That was absolutely fantastic and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. All right, take care, everyone. Right, take care.